Hi, everybody. <laughs> Good morning, everybody. My name is Dora, and I'm in Orange County. Good morning, everybody. Um, this is Michelle from Oregon. Great. Good morning. This is Jim from the underworld. <laughs> Jim Bones. Yay. <laughs> is that Kami from um, Ohio? Great to see you, everybody. Anna from Boston. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you. Oh, great. And if you can. Hi, guys. <laughs> Sorry, I'm a little late. A lot of activity with animals and neighbors and watching guys. And go ahead and close your eyes and breathe in and breathing out and breathing all the way in and breathing all the way out. And imagine that there is a waterfall of sparkling white light coming down from heaven. And it's cascading over your whole body and into the earth. And as you breathe in the spirit of Halloween, all the places of loneliness and darkness and sadness within you, just allow it to arise as though you were seeing a dark ocean and there are these powerful whales underneath the water and those represent our fears, our beautiful, magnificent, mysterious, hidden fears and allow those whales to surface to the top of this dark ocean as you breathe. Knowing that you're surrounded by a waterfall of the Holy Spirit's light the gold light of Mother God, Father God's wisdom. We have our spirit guides, Yogananda and Anastasia, and Pele Hunuamea, the volcano goddess, all of your healing angels, and your loved ones who've crossed over to the other side, because this is the time of year when the veil is thin between the living and the dead and they have come here to bless you now. And breathing in, joining hands with your healing angels and your guardian angels and your ancestors. Just breathing in and out, seeing these whales emerging from the ocean of your soul. And just like a whale rider, go ahead and get on top of the biggest whale which represents your greatest fear in life. Your greatest fear. And go ahead and imagine in your mind that you and this whale are riding through this ocean surrounded by all your other whales. And they're gonna take you on a journey today for Halloween a journey towards everything that is mysterious and unspoken and beautiful within you. Breathing, seeing Jesus in front of you. And right now he's going to face you as you're sitting on top of your whale. And he's gonna put his open palms down on top of your whale and see his hands glowing a neon blue the light of freedom. And as he does this and he blesses all of your fears and he blesses that which makes you mysterious and wonderful. See him breathing life into your will and breathing life into your soul and every part of your soul that is dead will now come back to life, to live for Halloween. All of your soul is beginning to live, 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 live. And breathing in and out, surrounding yourself with the pink light of self-love. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Wonderful, and now you can go ahead and open your eyes.
was our little Halloween blessing. <laughs> Thank you everyone for joining us. <clears throat> our Halloween word of the week is Happy Halloween, which is pronounced Haoli, which means happy, La, which means like the, and Halloween, Halloween. So say that after me, happy, how Oli, La, Hello We, or Hele We, Hello We. Okay, so how Oli, La, Hello We. So let's take a look at how Halloween is celebrated in many cultures around the world. So, um, let me just do this. So, Halloween originated 3,000 years ago from a Celtic holiday called Samhain, which means summer's end. So each year there's a fire festival in Edinburgh, Scotland, and they have bonfires, they do fortune telling, they wear costumes as animals or beasts to kind of scare off the ghosts. <coughs> now, in the year 609, Pope Boniface IV declared a celebration called All Saints Day. It's also called All Hallows in Middle English, named, known as Hallows Eve. And so that's when they honor all the martyrs and saints in history who have died. Now in the Philippines, All Saints Day is known as Dia de Todos los Santos, or Undas, which comes from the Spanish word honras, which means you honor, as in you honor your dead family members today, right now. Basically everyone goes to the cemetery and they set up a tent on their loved one's grave. They bring food, they play music, they basically have a party and a lot of them will bring blankets and they sleep overnight in the cemetery to remember their loved ones. So now in Mexico, completely unrelated to Halloween is the Day of the Dead, the Dia de los Muertos. And according to tradition, the gates of heaven are opened at midnight on October 31st and the spirits of children can rejoin their families for 24 hours. Then the spirits of adults do that same thing on November 2nd. And it's believed that the border between the spirit world and the real world dissolve. So the souls of the dead awaken, they return to the living world to feast, drink, dance, and play music with their loved ones. And in turn, the family members treat the deceased as honored guests in their celebrations. And they also leave the deceased's favorite foods and other offerings at grave sites. And they call them ofrendas or altars and they build them in their homes. Now ofrendas are decorated with candles, marigolds, um, red cock combs, food. You have like stacks of tortillas and fruit. Now the Igbo people in Nigeria believe that every two years a massive return of the Odo or the dead occurs where the dearly departed spend up to six months communing with the living. And then they welcome them back with festivities. They send them off with this theatrical Odo masquerade. And then they reenact the profound grief when the dead depart back to their land. Okay, now for Chinese people, uh, your ancestors don't just return for a visit, they want gifts. So to appease them, you can burn fake money, you can give them food, cell phones, cars, houses, not just for tax write-off. And it's also called Yulan, or a month-long Buddhist festival, where they hold Chinese operas outside so they can light dragons on fire. And then they leave the front row empty. It's like the VIP section for the dead people. It's called the Hungry Ghost Festival. Then they have these floating water lanterns. So this, if you're Chinese, is a really good time to talk to your dead relatives because they come back specifically to make amends for offenses committed against them. So for example, if your brother and sister stole your inheritance, you can ask your dead parents to play scary tricks on them. You know, to let them know that mommy and daddy are watching them from heaven and they're gonna come back every year to haunt them until they do the right thing. 
So Halloween can be good for some people and a day of reckoning for others. So it kind of depends which side you fall on. Now in Japan, it's kind of a good thing. They have the Daimanji Festival in Kyoto. They welcome the dead with food and dancing, and then they light five bonfires on the surrounding mountains with the character for big, which is pronounced dai. And it also means great, like as, as a farewell to the spirits returning back to the afterlife. Now in Denmark, they celebrate Festalon, where children dress up in costumes and they go house to house collecting candy and these cream filled buns called Festalon baller. And they, they take turns whacking a barrel filled with candy. And the barrels always have images of black cats on them because they historically the Danes believed that black cats would ward off evil spirits. Now, in Germany, they celebrate Walpugisnacht, which is witches' night. And they think that witches fly on broomsticks from Thale to Brocken Mountain, where they worship the devil around a raging bonfire. And in Romania, on the day of Count Dracula, who was a famous vampire, people go to Transylvania's Bran Castle, and they kind of go through these hidden tunnels. They wander through secret staircases. Now in Cambodia, which is Buddhist, and India, which is Hindu, they have a lot of similarities to Christianity. Halloween is about paying for the sins of the father. So in Cambodia, they celebrate Shumben, and it's a time to pay homage to ancestors from seven generations. And they believe that the gates of hell are open on this day, and it's necessary to ward off evil spirits by offering them food and a merit transfer ceremony. Okay, so in Buddhist culture, you can do a bunch of good deeds and then you accrue all these good karma points. And then you can spend your good karma points to pay for the bad deeds of one of your relatives or a friend so that they suffer less, either in this life or in, in, in their next life. So in India, they go back three generations and it's a festival called Pitra Paksha for, and it's, it's to honor the God of the dead, who's named Yama. And Yama takes souls hostage and holds them in purgatory or hell. And they meet three generations of their deceased relatives. And the soul is allowed to come to earth and unite with family members. And so the, the living people, they do a fire ritual known as Shraddha with very strict religious guidelines and then they also recite holy scriptures from the Bhagavad Gita. So those are sort of all our traditions from around the world. And um, I'd love to hear your comments. Well, I like Dia de los Muertos because that's, you know, I've done that many years. And I like, I like how you create the altar. I haven't done it in years, but you create an altar, usually with pictures of your loved ones that have passed and any anything Anything that was personal to them is also nice. Um, so I just like that ritual. I, I like, and I, one year I was in Mexico for it and they really take it to the next level. And I appreciate that honoring your loved ones who have passed. That's awesome. I love that, Dora. I, th I think it's interesting how, you know, there's so much, um, the different cultures have so, many, so much in common, um, so many common threads. I think that's really important that to look for is for those things that we share in common. Cool. <clears throat> yeah, so isn't it interesting that all over the world people celebrate a time when the living, can, the dead can come back and visit us? There's a belief, you know, about that. Um, how interesting with uh, Hawaii, Halloween, it being more from an American standpoint, a little more scary. And, um, and yet we want to have a communion with angels and with loved ones that seem to be more lighted 
and uplifting, but yet they're still the same beings. <laughs> they're still not in physical form. So it's interesting how we've, you know, uh, focused on certain aspects and made one more positive than the other. <laughs> it's kind of, I like the fact that you brought all of that forward. It's, I love the educational aspect. <laughs> Yeah, so as Americans, we don't honor death, right, as much as other cultures who are not afraid of death. And um, the way that we deal with it is we just say, oh, when they're dead, they turn into an angel. And we don't allow them to have their personality still that they do have when they cross over. And so all the other cultures sort of honor that. Let's talk about the meaning of our Halloween traditions. The very first Halloween tradition that we have is sort of the season. Halloween happens on the eve of darkness to mark the transition from the light to the dark part of the year. Darkness is the shadow side of our personalities, the things from our past that have come back to haunt us that we do not acknowledge. And we all have skeletons in the closet or the sins of our fathers which have been forgotten, or trauma from our past that we've buried deep in our psyches. On Halloween, our ghosts come back to haunt us and remind us that they're still alive somewhere in the dark corners of our subconscious. Halloween is the transition from the light, what we know, to the dark, what we pretend not to know. So the second tradition is costumes, dressing up. Now in many cultures, people dressed in costume to imitate dead people. Like literally, dead people have died. You, you dress up as them and you go around house to house visiting your neighbors. So when they open the door, you're dressed up as Aunt Enos who died five years ago. And you say, hey, I thought you thought I was dead, but I'm back, give me a treat. Now, if they like Aunt Enith, they give you a treat. If they don't like Aunt Edith, they slam the door in your face. And then you play a trick on them. Okay, which brings us to that third Halloween tradition, trick or treat. A trick is a way to distract someone from what they're doing. You kind of jolt them out of their ordinary mindset and you force them to pay attention to something unusual surprising or disturbing. Now, a treat is for when you already acknowledge the ghosts of your past. Good job, you get a treat. A trick is for someone who refuses to acknowledge the ghosts of their past, and so the ghost plays a trick on them to get their attention. So have you ever had angels or God send you a message? Yes, because you get angel numbers, you always get signs from heaven that you're protected. Now, the opposite of an angel message is an angel warning. They're trying to warn you. Pay attention. If you don't pay attention, the ghosts of your past are going to play a trick on you to force you to look at what you're refusing to see. So now this brings us to the fourth Halloween tradition, where the dead come to life. Now, all around the world, ancient people believe that Halloween is the time of year when the dead have the ability to haunt the living. So the veil between dimensions is very thin. So think about what a ghost is. A ghost is an unforgiven sin. When Jesus raises the dead to life in the Bible, the symbolism is that he's raising you from feeling dead inside or that feeling that your soul is dead to feeling alive and to feeling that your soul is alive now because you're free from being haunted by the past. The dead or people who have wronged us in our past or that we've wronged them in our past, that haunts us throughout our lives. So there's this Netflix TV show called Messiah and the Jesus figure is Syrian. And he's being chased by an Israeli policeman. And the policeman kills a boy during a police raid. And the guilt 
makes him like the walking dead. He's walking around, but he's dead inside. So Alma C, the Jesus figure in this TV show, raises the policeman from the dead after he dies from a helicopter crash. And what Jesus is actually doing is helping the policeman acknowledge the parts of himself that died and allowing those parts of himself to be brought back to life so that he can be free and not be haunted anymore. Okay, so these are some of our Halloween traditions. Uh, what do you think? Do, does anyone want to comment? Kind of interesting when you think about Halloween and in the past evolving forward and the fear of seeing something. I always wanted to see an angel, physically see an angel. And I was told, uh, and to see my inner teacher physically. Um, and I was told because of the fear of seeing a ghost, that door doesn't open up. And so Halloween in some ways keeps that door kind of closed. When you're talking, I can see, okay, that maintains my fear because <laughs> of the dark stuff. When I recognized that, or I was shown that the word sin was really missing the mark of what your own soul created. So I, uh, I still want to see an angel. And so my inner teacher told me, pretend that, that there's an angel standing in the hallway in order to help me with my own personal dark fear of seeing the so-called ghost. Uh, and so I can see that Halloween's kind of giving me, your, your lesson is giving me a little different perspective in order to deal with that, those concepts that are been there for centuries that are downright scary. Scary. Okay, that's really good. I love how you said that because that's what we're going to talk about next is our fears. <laughs> So Halloween is also the time of year when we celebrate things that we're scared of. Now, normally, we don't like to celebrate terror, but on Halloween, it's A-OK. -okay. So what we fear the most would probably be evil. And so what's evil? Evil is something that has power over you, the power to destroy you, to make you suffer, to turn you into a deformity or a monster, and you have no control. So the fear of evil is the fear of losing control over what you are becoming and turning it into something that disgusts, frightens, or repels you. So please write that in your journal. Okay, so let's look at our most nightmarish fears. Like the first one is zombies. So zombies are unstoppable. They can climb. Uh, they can climb walls. They're really crazy. So 
zombies represent our society's fears of drug addicts. Because if you look at the way that zombies are, they always have scratch marks and bruises from needles. They're kind of always zombied out. They uncontrollably shake sometimes when they walk, like they've done uh, drugs. And then they can also climb walls like they're high on crack. So they're basically, zombies are unstoppable. They're like sponsored by Nike. (laughs) Now, monsters... Monsters represent our fear of being unattractive, like ugly, fat, wrinkled, hairy, having different skin tones. And monsters are usually all of those things. They're blue, green, purple, and they have big polka dots. So let's hear it for the monsters. Yay, dare to be different. Okay, then we have vampires. Vampires represent our fear of greed. So in the movie American Psycho, Christian Bale plays a Wall Street broker who sucks the blood out of the masses so that the few elite can live in gilded luxury. If you've ever read Interview with a Vampire by Anne Rice, vampires represent global capitalism, which preys on weaker, poorer communities of color. So no one likes genocide. But vampires do. They love it. Okay, so mummies. Mummies represent our fear of people who are obsessed with their looks. So society teaches us to fear anorexics who starve themselves to be skinny and to judge celebrities who do excessive plastic surgery. So mummies are mannequins. They pose for pictures. They don't talk. They don't really relate to others. Their eyes are empty. And we fear that level of vanity because of the deep loneliness that surrounds people who are vain. If you recall that movie Blonde, claims that Marilyn Monroe was lonely because she was vain. And the message of the movie is, don't be Marilyn. Don't do it. You'll turn into a mummy. Meanwhile, every young woman in America wants to be Marilyn Monroe. Okay, so then we have werewolves. Werewolves represent society's fear of sexual predators or rapists or men who want to steal your energy, your life force, and drain you of your free will. When's last call, 2 a.m., you're just a piece of meat. Well, do you know how many women want Hugh Jackman to treat them like a piece of meat? There's a waiting list. Okay, so witches represent society's fear of powerful women. If they're young and beautiful witches, they'll hypnotize you and put a spell on you. If they are old, they can put, on, they can put a spell on themselves and make themselves appear to be fair maidens. So witches pretend to love you, but don't trust a powerful woman to love you. She's just using you, probably to throw you into a cauldron so she can cook you and make another super duper magic potion. Yay! Okay, so now we have Frankenstein. Frankenstein represents our deepest fear of not being loved, especially by your own family or creator. So not being seen as lovable because you were born different. Now this is the most popular trope in Western culture. The outcast is always a superhero who doesn't know it yet. Their superhero makes them feel like Frankenstein, a monster whom no one can love. And then boom, they become Batgirl, a slimy, rubbery bat who turns into a sexy bat bombshell. Okay, now another Halloween monster we have, the Grim Raper. Basically looks like a skeleton in a robe. The Grim Reaper causes you to die and then collects your soul and guides you to afterlife. So why do we fear the Reaper? I mean, he's obviously trying to help us. But it's just like a stewardess on an airplane that's been hit by a bomb. She's just trying to help you because you're going to die now. So why are you scared of the one person assigned to help you while you are hurtling towards death? makes no sense. It's because we fear aging and dying. So the reaper represents our fear of aging and dying. 
Then we have ghouls. Ghouls eat human flesh. So you can find them in graveyards because that's basically buffet. And ghouls represent our fear of unending loneliness. So eating is the exact opposite of loneliness. It's very intimate because when you eat someone else, they become part of you. Not that you eat people, but you know what you are what you eat. Then we have goblins. Goblins are mischievous. They play tricks. They cause harm. They're laughing all the time because they're jokesters. Goblins represent our fear of criminals and con artists because they're always stealing what they themselves don't possess. Like they steal your friends. They steal your joy. They steal your stuff. They steal things that are in your heart, not just in your pocket. And they represent our fear of not being relevant and not having meaning. So do you know people who are like little goblins? They can't be serious about anything. Everything's a joke to them, including themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it, it's, it, it's, yeah, we're talking about evil, so it's, it's getting a little, it's getting a little draining, but it's Halloween, so, so we have to be happy and excited about, about evil. <laughs> okay, so the next Halloween monster that we are taught to fear that represents our repressed fears is the Headless Horseman. And the Headless Horseman represents our fear of losing our identity, not knowing who you are and searching for it your whole life. So the Headless Horseman can't find his own head, so he's, he'll settle for anyone else's head, it's fine. So remember when Amy Schumer, the comedian, said that the Kardashians take the face that they were born with as a light suggestion? Well, they're obviously not afraid of a full face transplant. And I don't blame them because wouldn't you rather have someone else's face than no face at all? So the irony is that the headless horseman is carrying his head under his arm. So he does have a face, he just doesn't know it. And he keeps searching for a new one. Just like the Kardashians, they have a face, they just keep searching for new ones. So now we have trolls. Trolls live in caves or they live in really rocky areas where no one can find them. And they only come out at night because if they're in the sun, they turn to stone. So that means they're always hiding. Have you ever heard of internet trolls? They hide behind their screen names, they attack you from the shadows. So trolls represent our fear of being rendered powerless, our fear of being needy. And somehow they've turned vulnerability into shame. So they throw rocks at people because they need to vent, like rock throwing is kind of like therapy, like, ah, you know? So that's, that's what trolls are. And we have swamp monster. Now, water represents emotions and swamp monsters are always wallowing in their emotions. Nothing is ever dealt with. And swamp monsters represent our fear of becoming a big hot mess, a diva, a drama queen. So you think about people that you know, right? Okay, then we have ghosts. Now ghosts represent our unforgiven deeds, our unfinished business, our unresolved conflicts that we still think about that are haunting us from our past. That's what a ghost is. And then, of course, we have aliens for Halloween. Halloween's a big alien. Aliens represent our fear of the government. In reality, I believe, this is my opinion, there's other opinions, I believe aliens are very highly evolved conscious beings, and they're just trying to help humanity survive climate change. But for Halloween, and in pop culture, aliens stun you with this powerful ray gun, and they paralyze you, and they beam you up on their spaceship where they... they they perform medical experiments on you. Sounds very familiar to a uh, human experience of war. So aliens trigger our fear of a powerful force that can do whatever they want with you and your body against your will. So aliens represent our fear of political oppression. Now we have demons. Demons this is a basic demon, your basic demon, fallen angel. Now, um, if you take a regular angel, you just twist it all up into an emaciated tangle and put horns on it and then shred its wings. So that's basically a demon. So demons represent our fear of falling from grace. 
And that's it. Those are all our Halloween tra traditions. What do you guys think? Or does it remind you of something that you're afraid of becoming yourself or or represents one of our your fears or their fears to become that monster? Um, at least in suburban Boston metro area, it's become popular to spend hundreds of dollars on huge Halloween decorations. Um, you know, plastic figures that are 15 feet tall. And my nephew, who's eight, like, loves them so much and wants his parents to buy them. And before you went through this portion, I was kind of thinking, like, wow, all these, you know, that there's this human need for this belief structure and this kind of understanding, but we just have entertainment. Like, it's been replaced for us with just, like, entertainment, not with, kind of traditions that satisfy its needs, but just a shallow entertainment, there is still um, something connecting with these deeper parts of us rather than those deeper parts of us being just um, completely taken offline. So thank you for that. Wow. Thanks for that comment. Yeah. And um, the dead teach us what we don't see in life is that um, the parts of ourselves we don't want to look at, like you better acknowledge that or you'll turn into it or you'll turn into that monster that you fear. And it's also an easier way for us to understand like, like, why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Well, you're a vampire. That's what you do. You know, that's it, it's it's easier for us to see and acknowledge those monsters that are externalized and the dead Remind us that. Remind us of the things that we don't want to look at. I thought that's interesting uh, to know all those. And then also I just noticed probably because of movies and stuff, but monsters, um, aliens, sometimes kind of nice ones, funny ones, not like scary ones. And then so they are kind of some things like in the middle. And probably like a Frankenstein kind of things. Probably he's lonely, wants to have friends, but cannot have friends. And everybody try to catch him or try to kill him. So he becomes a monster. And then it's kind of those kind of things seems like happening. And then another thing I thought was like a ghost. People think ghosts are scary. And then ghost is usually the one that people who are dead, right? Uh, but we call like a ghost as more like a scary one and a spirit as good ones, like uh, our family member coming back and stuff. And I thought it's interesting because um, I've been interested in about all those kind of uh, mediums, those kind of things. And then some ghosts who even try to scare people are also sending messages and stuff. So it's interesting to separate ghost and spirit. And that's what I kind of wondering about kind of differences how people make you know um separating good ones and bad ones and stuff yeah super interesting jim what were you gonna say yeah culturally especially with the rise of zombies has been very popular and um what is that telling us about our society and you know you got the the rise in in addiction you know there's a lot of um uh drug addictions that's been going on. So that's, you know, it kind of makes sense that popular culture is reflecting this um, uh, popular zombie stories. And, uh, and then you've got, you know, aliens and, you know, fear of government. And of course, that's another big theme that's kind of going on. And then of course, the trolls. So it's really interesting how these things kind of tie into sort of cultural phenomenon that's happening now. Yeah, and our fears represent the things that turn us into monsters or dehumanize us, like vanity or greed or loneliness and um, not being loved. Those things dehumanize us. And by looking, like I think of that Bible verse where God says, do not be afraid. Do not be afraid of what is within you, even if it looks like it's death. It is just the power, the power that you fear to dehumanize yourself is within you. You own that power and you can make it live again like these dry bones in the desert or how Jesus raised people from the dead. You, you have the power within you to, to make what is dead within you alive 
and the power, and you fear that, you fear death, but you, that power of the things that you fear are within you, and you've turned them into your monsters. But on Halloween, you party with your monsters, <laughs> and you receive the message, hey, babe, you know, you're afraid of being lonely. You're afraid of this. Don't worry about it. Let's live with ourselves. When I was young, my first job was at a, a theater, bow theater. As a steward, you know, you used to have walk people in with a little flashlight and show them their seat. Well, there was a, the movie, The Monster of the Black Lagoon. And there was a part in that film. And on Saturday, all the parents used to drop their kids off. And we were just a babysitter, <laughs> basically. But there were certain scenes where I couldn't handle it. I mean, the monster coming out of the water and these little little kids thinking of taking these little kids into this theater to see this terrible thing. And so I would make people, even uh, teenagers, wait until past that particular <laughs> those two scenes. I wouldn't let them in. <laughs> and so when you look at now the film industry and the TVs use terms, we were scared of monsters, those terms. Now the terms are demons and the walking dead and all of those. And I think in terms of the dark ages and that we're cycling back and in order to heal that, this generation that's living with these terms and watching these and understanding, okay, the fear's inside, then you recognize, okay, they're healing not only the earth, but themselves of something that was laid in there centuries ago. Yeah, and it's so interesting that we don't fear um ambition or trying to make a lot of money or trying to get plastic surgery or taking drugs, we, we kind of celebrate those things until we begin to realize on a spiritual level that sometimes when we take things into excess, we we're turning ourselves into monsters or that one behavior is dehumanizing us. Um, and so by making a monster, we're able to see the dark parts of ourselves that, that we feel make us less human. Now that's our own judgment that we feel that that makes us less human and we're afraid of becoming dehumanized. But we're not afraid of plastic surgery. We're not afraid of this. We're not afraid of, you know, hurting someone or having a ghost and be like, screw, you know? So that's Halloween. <laughs> Dora? Um, when I was working at Rose Hills, which is a mortuary, the Chinese believe that you know, that you do certain rituals, even at the grave site, you don't look at the casket going down because if there's an evil spirit there, it could uh, like possess you. So I know I went one time to a service and I was there, one of the Chinese counselors and afterward he said, when you go home, don't go straight home. He said, stop like at a Walmart or a Vons. And he says, and just go up and down the aisles on the off chance a spirit is following you. You can lose them there. So I was like, you know, so guess what I did on the way home? I stopped <laughs> because I was like, I'm not taking that chance. But, you know, I, I think working there really opened up my eyes to the afterlife because I, I believe there is one. And I do believe that some spirits refuse to cross over. And I do believe that, you know, they can't, some evil spirits will, in, you know, inhibit you. You know, it, 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 I think that they pry on weaker souls here, you know, to, to do whatever they're gonna do. That's wonderful, yeah. And our Halloween traditions help, um, help us deal with and protect us from those things that we fear. So that's perfect. I need to piggyback with what Dora mentioned. In Japan, when we go to a uh, funeral, and then after we come back, before we enter the house, we have to wash our hands with uh, salt so that we will not have bad luck. So salt means like a cleanse, the things um, like a bad luck, those kind of things. So whenever we come back from funeral, 
we just clean our hands with the salt. That's I just remember after after Dorothy said. So I just wanted to mention that. That's awesome. Wonderful. <clears throat> okay, very good. So just to remind us that monsters and ghosts and whatnot, which are very real, they're coming back at this time of your Halloween to remind us of all the things that we fear and also to help us reclaim the parts of ourselves that have died that need and so that they don't turn the parts of ourselves that have died so that those parts within ourselves don't turn into our own monsters and our own demons and our own ghosts that haunt us. We look at them, we party with them, we talk to them, we make friends with them, and we don't fear them anymore. And when we don't fear them, they won't turn into our monsters. They, they become part of our, our power, our mystery, our hidden shadow side that makes everything much more interesting. Let's go ahead and do our closing prayer. So go ahead and close your eyes and breathe in and breathe out. Imagine that there is a white light surrounding you, the light of the Holy Spirit, a light in this time of harvest of autumn when the year is becoming darker and breathing, imagine that you see Jesus in front of you However, he comes to you, whatever he's wearing, if he's in a Halloween costume or a robe, he's dressed up as your favorite fear. And just breathing in and out and seeing sparkling lights coming out of his body and his torso and his hands and those sparkling lights are just floating towards you. And see those sparkling Halloween lights like candles just coming towards you, giving you life. And breathing in and out. Hear Jesus saying to you, I am not afraid to look at you. I'm not afraid to look at your monsters. I'm not afraid to look at your addiction or your vanity, or your despair, or your loneliness. I'm not afraid to see you when your arms are hacked off from chemotherapy, or when you're, I'm not afraid of the blood. I love you and you are human to me. Even when you try to make a part of yourself a monster, I will come and I will make you human again and see him looking at you with his eyes, see his eyes glowing. And now when you go out to celebrate Halloween and you see all those monsters, the scary ones and the cute ones, these are the parts of your soul that you can own. Even the darkness you own, even the darkness serves you. Even the darkness is your power over life. And the darkness is the mystery and the beauty of your soul that you celebrate. And like a witch you can fly, like a zombie you can scale walls, like a Frankenstein you can sing. You are all the mysteries of the darkness and all the beautiful things that reside there. And you are not afraid to look at those things and you are not afraid to see yourself. Breathing in and out, seeing all the Halloween angels coming to celebrate this season with you. They're all wearing costumes and they love this time of year to show you the secrets of the mysterious darkness that are only apparent this time of year. It's a magical time and you are protected this holiday season. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Whenever you're ready, you can open your eyes. Let's go ahead and do our round of goodbyes. You can unmute and say, um, 
goodbye or thank someone else on the call who shared? Um, this was like the best uh, fall Sunday service ever. <laughs> I learned a lot. So thank you, Pastor Vicki, um, for the education. And I'm just really looking forward to um, uh, the next couple of weeks, you know, just, just um, keeping, this in, keeping this in mind, carrying it with me until next time. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vicky, for teaching all different kind of monsters and stuff like that. And I learned a few new things. So that was great. And um, thank you for everybody who um, did some comment. Thank you, Vicky. It was a great service too. I really learned a lot about the different cultures, how, how similar we are in many ways and how we all treat, you know, our monsters and death differently. So thank you everybody that shared too. Thank you, Pastor Vicky. I learned a lot and I loved hearing about the other cultures and the different ways that they celebrate. That was really interesting. Thank you so much. I hope everybody has a great few weeks until we meet again. Um, and thanks, Dodie, for joining us, and Sophia and Anna. Awesome. And thanks, Mary, for joining us. I'll see you first week of November for our series, Jesus is a Badass. Okay. Thank you all. Goodbye from Haleho Anani. See you next time. <laughs>